Hello. So today I'm going to talk to you about all of the things that people do to stop us from hacking. And although you may think that's not fun, it actually is. And we found ways around pretty much all of these, right? I will briefly go into those as well. So I'll start with probably the most basic one. So canaries. The reason they're called canaries is because back in the old days, um, basically people worried about mines exploding because of gas that was there. Um, and one of the ways to tell if there was a fair bit of gas in a mine was they'd send canaries down there. And if the canaries died, there was gas, get out of there. So basically a canary is just something that we're willing to sacrifice for our personal gain, which is an awful way to think about what can you do. Okay. So the way that canaries are used in computers is it is put as a stack protector. So, for example, if we were to have this here, we'll go sharp. Typically, what a computer actually does is it puts something called a canary on the stack so it can tell if it's um, been overflowed. So I will show you. So. Like I said before, we've got our return address on the stack. Then we've got a few other things, maybe our EBP, which is our base pointer. Then what we can have is we can have our canary. And then say we've got this over here, which is just STR. So basically what happens is if we were to um, overwrite this, we would also overwrite this canary value. But the computer notes what this canary value actually is. So the idea is, once you override it, then the computer's going to realize this, realize something malicious is probably happening, and therefore it's just going to exit out of the program before you can have your fun. Which ruins our fun. So basically, canaries are bad for us. There are ways around canaries, though. If we find a memory leak in the program, uh, sorry, memory leak probably isn't the best way because of uh, saying it because there's something else called a memory leak. But if there is a way where we can find out what the canary is before we enter in our payload, this effectively allows us to get completely around it because we know what it is, so we can write what we want, the canary value, which is now unchanged, and then we can continue to override everything here. So if you were on a computer, um, the way that you disable this is when you're compiling it, you put in the um, flag minus F no minus stack minus protector. So when we're learning, typically we don't use a lot of these things, um, at least in the early days, so that you can have a few easy victories first. So that is what canaries are. So NX is basically means um, non-executable stack, right? So if you know a bit about buffer overflow, basically what we do in a buffer overflow is we put our shell code in the stack and then we return to our shell code which allows us to execute it. They figured out that if they make this non-executable, it makes things a lot harder um, to actually get around. So. Imagine, yeah, so basically we can no longer just put our shellcode in the stack. Um, interestingly, this also does prevent you from putting it in environment variables because that ends up in the same piece of non-executable memory as the stack. So, there's actually a really cool way around this one, but unfortunately it does raise the difficulty a fair bit. So basically we use this thing called return-oriented programming, or ROPing as it's often called, or ret to libc. So basically what we do is instead of returning to the shellcode here, what we do is we change the return address here. And what we do is we make it return to something that is already on the computer, um, which is why it's called ret to libc. So libc is a giant library and it has a ton of things. And the cool thing about it is Imagine you've got some massive thing, some massive function, and it does something fairly complex, and the last two instructions on it are, for example, increment this register and exit. What we can actually do, say we want to increment that register, 
is we can return just to the increment register and exit, and then we have effectively got increment register and exit in this thing here, although it's not our shell code, it still works. So now, as you can imagine, if you get a bunch of these return statements, you keep, so it is the return-oriented programming. So the idea is you return to something that's useful, it then exits, returns back, or jumps to something else that's useful, returns, jumps to something else that's useful, and you can end up launching a shell through that. So that is actually a really cool technique. So that is what a non-executable stack is, prevents you from executing shell code on the stack, and the way we get around it is return-oriented programming. So the last one. The last one is probably the least fun to get around, unfortunately. It's called ASLR, and basically what it does is it randomizes addresses. So you know how we're used to getting our thing, and it's like, say this is our memory, and we know that main is always going to be up here, and then our next function is always going to be here, and then we know that our stack is going to be here, for example. Uh, by the way, this is not correct, I'm just drawing random things. Basically what it does is it says, uh, and then we'll say libc is here. Basically what ASLR does is it says every time you run this program, this stuff is going to change. So main is not always going to be at the top, it's going to be down here, and then this is going to be over there, and it just makes life a massive mess. So as you can imagine, how are you meant to return to something when its address changes almost every time? Luckily, there is also a way around this, um, but you need to find another vulnerability um, before you can actually do that. So, typically, the way we get around this is if we can find out the starting address of libc um, from our program, this effectively allows us to then use the offsets from libc and add them to where we know libc starts. So even if it has been randomized, we know that libc starts here, right? And then for example, say, um, so uh, I'll quickly just say something which I missed with ropping. Basically, um, we call them gadgets, are uh, the little things. So if it was like increment this register and exit, if we were to jump to that, we're jumping to a gadget is typically what they call. So let's say we've got a gadget that we want right here and we know that the offset is, let's say, something like that, like, oh, well that's great, because then if we get this address, we can still figure out where the gadget that we want is, which is extremely useful, as now we can get around ASLR. So, hope you enjoyed this video, hopefully there's plenty more to come.